Have you ever opened up your AMF TYS and thought to yourself, Wow, I instantly regret all my life choices. Because so have I, and that's why in this video, I'll be explaining every single topic from the AMF syllabus and revealing all my tips and tricks. So hopefully you too can go from Genshin Incel to AMF Giga Chat. Wait, but my exam is literally tomorrow. No worries, I got you, because here is Axie's AMF tier list. list. Perfect for last minute students like yourself. It's basically a tier list of all the topics ranging from easy game must do at the top all the way down to why do you even exist. Okay, hope your last two brain cells are ready for this complete a math guide solving 200 IQ math questions and dank memes. Are you ready? Let's go! You know how like there's the iPhone 14 and the iPhone 14 Pro, but they're just basically the same thing? So this topic is the same thing as the eMath version of completing the square, but instead of adding one camera, we're just adding one number in front of the x square term. Okay, let's try this example out over here. So we're going to start by factorizing the x square and the x term so that the coefficient of the x square term is 1. So let's take out the negative 2. Now we're going to complete the square of the x square term and the x term by making it into the form of x plus something square minus something square. So this something, right, is just the coefficient of x, which is 6, and then you divide it by 2. And let's put that in our equation over here. After expansion, we get the answer of negative 2 x plus 3 square plus 21. The coefficient of x square is negative 2 at the start, so we know that it's a set phase and it looks something like this. Now for the turning point or the maximum point, it's just negative b comma c. So in this case, the turning point is negative 3 comma 21 and we're done. Next is the topic on inequality, which will teach you step by step on how to become a social justice warrior. I, I, I mean, I mean, I'm just a talking axolotl who has no rights, right? <laughs> okay, so let's take a look at these two curves over here. We notice that every point on the red curve lies above the blue line. So we can say that the red equation is greater than the blue equation. Okay, let's try to use the analogy to solve this question. Since it says that the first equation lies above the second equation, so it means that 2x squared minus 6x plus 3 is greater than 11. So we can move the 11 over to the other side. So the next step is to factorize our quadratic. And we can use the calculator trick. If you know, you know. And then we have to draw this diagram of the graph. It's a smiley face because the coefficient of x squared is positive, and the roots are negative 1 and 4, so we indicate on the diagram. Our equation says greater than 0, so we are interested in the region that's above the x-axis. Now we shade the parts of the curve that's above the x-axis in red, and we can tell that the range of values of the red portion is the left of negative 1 and the right of 4, and there we have our answer. As a kid, have you ever played one of those flash games where you like put your friend's names in this love machine thing and they like tell you how likely, you know, they feel the love? <coughs> yeah, me neither. But this time, we have to put two equations into our love machine and this thing will calculate the discriminant and the formula is b squared minus 4ac. So if the discriminant is greater than zero, it means that the two equations intersect at two distinct points. If it's equal to zero, it means it touches at one point, which is a tangent, and if the discriminant is less than zero, that means it does not touch at all. So for this question, it's kind of like the same thing. We put our two equations together, and we combine the x square and x terms together. We do b square minus 4ac is less than zero, because the question says does not intersect. We draw the graph using the same method as before, and because the region is less than 0, which is here, the answer is the region between 0 and 4. Okay, do you notice that in our second example, we needed to find b squared minus 4ac, but the first example we don't need? Okay, okay, I hope you're ready for some pro tips. So, if you see the words, find the value of x, it means that you probably don't need to do b squared minus 4ac, because it's just an inequalities question. But if they ask you to find the values of k or m or whatever, right, you know you gotta use that b squared minus 4ac. Certs is literally just a fancy way of saying square root. 
In this chapter, there's only two concepts you need to know. Number one, simplifying search, and number two, rationalization. So let's say I want to simplify square root of 48. I'm going to look for one of these perfect square numbers like 4, 9, 16, and 25 that I can divide 48 by. Oh, just nice, 48 divided by 16 gives us 3. So let's rewrite 48 as 16 times 3. Now, we split apart the square root like some cell division magic thing, and we can see that the square root of 16 is just 4. So our final answer is just 4 root 3. Next, rationalization is just trying to get rid of any square roots at the bottom of the fraction. So let's say we have this fraction over here, and we don't want to see that root 3 at the bottom. So we have to rationalize it by multiplying the top and the bottom with its conjugate. So the conjugate here is just 2 plus root 3, but importantly, we have to flip the sign of the square root. So it becomes 2 minus root 3. So we multiply these two fractions and you can see that the square root at the bottom is gone and we're done. You know those gacha toy machines that you always see in your neighborhood? When I was young, I remember telling myself, okay, I'm gonna put $1 in and I'm sure I can get my favorite Pokemon. And that's how my gambling addiction started. In this topic, you are usually given some kind of polynomial f of x, which works just like the gacha machine. We let x equals to something, and we put it inside f of x, and we get out a result. So there's just two simple theorems that you need to know. Number one, the factor theorem, and number two, the remainder theorem. So whenever we see words like exactly divisible, or like leaves no remainder, right, we know that this x plus 3 is a factor of fx. So what we gotta do is this weird shifty thing where we let x plus 3 is equal to 0. Then we shift the 3 over to the other side and we get x equals to negative 3. So let's sub this x equals to negative 3 inside. So we write it as f of negative 3 is equal to 0. So what this means is that when fx divides by x plus 3, there is 0 remainder. Now we sub x equals to negative 3 inside the equation, and we get our first other equation, 3a minus b is equals to negative 27. Now the remainder theorem is basically like the same thing, but we have to do this weird shifty thing again for x minus 4 is equals to 0. So it becomes x equals to 4. Since it leaves a remainder of 56, so we write it as f of 4 is equals to 56. We sub that in, and we get our second equation of 4a plus b equals to negative 8. So from here, we can actually solve for a and b by using simultaneous equation, and we get our final answer to be a is equal to negative 5, and b is equal to 12. Also, right, if the question wants you to simplify f of x, because x plus 3 is a factor of f of x, we can actually do long division to factorize out f of x. Since I'm a lazy axolotl, you can check out this video over here if you don't know how. And this x squared minus 3x plus 4 here has no real roots, so it can't be simplified further. So this is our final factorization. The whole idea of this topic is taking a disgusting looking fraction like this and trying to make it into a few smaller parts. So sadly, you have to memorize these three formulas. So the first one is the easiest, where there's just two brackets and we split them up into A and B, which we're going to solve for later on. The second one is the really weird one where the square is outside of the bracket, but please note that the B term doesn't have the square, but the C term has the square. And for the last one is where the square is inside of the bracket, so you can see the x square over here. And then the other term will be bx plus c. Okay, let's try out this example. So the first step is to always check if the power at the top is greater than or equal to the power at the bottom. If so, we have to long divide. So the highest power at the top is x square, and the bottom is also x square, so we need to do long division to split it up like this. Okay, the quotient is 2, which goes out over here, and the remainder is 2x minus 19, which is the top of the fraction. Now, after factorizing the bottom, we see that it's actually the first case. So let's write down the full equation and combine this a and b into one big fraction. By comparing just the top part of both fractions, we can get something like this. Now, we try to solve for a and b by letting x equals to something. We are trying to make one of the brackets kind of like equals to 0. So let's try to let x equals to 2. Because 2 minus 2 here will be 0 and a will just disappear from our equation. We solve for b which is equal to negative 3. 
Lastly, we can solve for a by letting x is equal to negative 3, and we get the value of a is equal to 5. Now, the final step is just to put our entire partial fraction back together, and we're done. I want to give a quick shout out to the sponsor of this video, which is none other than me! <laughs> I'm just a poor struggling axolotl with no sponsors trying to teach you a math so I can afford food. So why not like this video? Or maybe share it with a friend who's an absolute a math idiot. Or maybe even consider subscribing to my only fan. Binomial is all about dealing with things like 1 minus 2x but raised to some higher power. I know this formula looks a little bit crazy, but let's start with this vertical bracket thing here, which is read as n choose 1. So for example, if we have 6 choose 2, it's like in a team of 6 Pokemon, how many ways can I choose 2 of them at a time for a double battle? There's actually a button on the calculator to press this 6 choose 2, and it gives us 15. So let's try to expand this 1 minus 2x to the power of 8 using the crazy formula. We can see that a is equal to 1, and b is equal to negative 2x, and n is equal to 8. So let's put all of this into our formula to calculate the first three terms. And since there's many more terms, we just put this plus dot 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 thing at the end. Now, for example, this question asks you to find the coefficient of x squared in this expansion. We only need to expand 1 minus 2x power 8 up to the x squared term, and we can do some magic. Okay, do you remember about mixing colors back in primary school art class? Yeah, me neither. That's why I feel art, okay? Okay, okay, let's try. Light blue plus red gives us purple. But dark blue plus magenta also gives us purple. So let's use the idea that different mixes can both give me purple. We look at this expansion and ask ourselves, which terms mixed together can give us x squared? So you can see that the first one is this negative 16x multiplied by x, so that will give us x squared. And the second one is this 112x squared multiplied by 2 to give us another x squared term. So we can just add those two coefficients up and we get the final answer of 208. There's an even more difficult type of question where you need to use this tr plus 1 formula, which is just like a general version of just now's formula. So for example, if r is equal to 4, and remember it's tr plus 1, so it represents the 4 plus 1 equals the fifth term inside the expansion. So let's look at this question, and if you see some like really weird stuff in the bracket like x cubed and 1 over x, most likely you need to do tr plus 1. So doing tr plus 1 helps us find out what value of r would actually give me this x to the power of 11 term. So we can see the indices of the x terms and we multiply them. So 3 multiplied by 9 minus r from this term and negative r from this term equals to 11. So we can solve for r and we get r is equals to 4. So what this means is that when r is equals to 4, it will give us the x to the power of 11 term. Now, we put this r is equal to 4 inside the coefficients of the tr plus 1 term because now we don't care about the x terms anymore because we solved for that already. So 9 choose 4 times 2 to the power of 9 minus 4 times 1 to the power of 4 will give us the final answer, which is 4032. Believe it or not, there's an even, even more difficult type of question where they give you an unknown power and then you need to solve for this n value over here you usually have to expand out the first three terms of this. Now, this is the part that you have to memorize. n choose 1 is just n, and n choose 2 is n bracket n minus 1 all divided by 2. And you just take out the coefficients of x and x squared, and then just equate it to 900. Okay, like, you can solve from here because I'm lazy. <laughs> Hi, I want to play a game. We have three numbers here, 2, 3, and 8. Our goal is to make each of the three numbers using the other two. So to make 8 using 2 and 3, we can take 2 to the power of 3. To get 2 using 8 and 3, we can take the cube root of 8. But now, how do we get 3 using 2 and 8? You have 5 seconds. Live or die. Good luck. So that is where we need to use a logarithm. So log base 2 of 8 will give us 3. So the log is kind of like asking itself, how many times do I need to multiply 2 by itself 
in order to get 8. So 2 multiplied by itself 3 times gives you 8. So the answer is 3. So 3 blue, 1 brown actually calls this the triangle of power. Let's first go through all of the logarithm laws. So number 1, adding 2 logs of the same base, you can actually combine it by multiplying the numbers together. Number 2, when you minus 1 log from another of the same base, it becomes the first divided by the second. Now remember our log 2, 8 is equal to 3. So let's write the 8 as 2 to the power of 3. Okay, law number 3. We can actually shift this 3 all the way down in front of the log. And if you want, you can also shift it up. Number 4. Any log of the same base and number will be equal to 1. So this log 2, 2 over here, it's gone. It's just equal to 1. And the answer is also 3. Nice. There's also a few rare species of logs that you'll find in the wild, namely LN and LG. LON just means log base E and LG just means log base 10. And the log button on your calculator is actually LG. Yeah, don't ask me why either. Now let's try to change the base of log base 2 of 8 into a base 5. So usually in questions, we want to change to the lowest base among all of the logs. So the first step is to put down a fraction of log base 5 at the top and also log base 5 at the bottom. Now remember, the top will always go to the top and the bottom will always go to the bottom. So the top, which is 8, will go to the top and then the bottom, which is 2, will go to the bottom. Whenever you want to solve for x that's inside of a log, just remember our best friend log 2, 8 is equal to 3. So for example, if we have log 3x equals to 5 and we want to solve for x, we just compare it with this. So we can see that x right now is in the position that 8 is in. And since 8 is just 2 to the power of 3, therefore x is just 3 to the power of 5. Let's try out two examples. So the first one is the solving for logs kind. And our goal is to try to combine all the logs together. So we can combine the left side into x minus 1 divided by x plus 1. And for the right side, we can rewrite the 1 as log 5, 5. Next, we can combine it with the 1 over 7 to get log 5, 5 over 7. Now, if we have log 5 on one side, right, and log 5 on another side, we can actually just cancel them out. So what's left is just to cross multiply our fraction, and then we can solve for x, which gives us x equals to 6. I know it doesn't really make much of a difference in this question, but we actually can sub this x equals to 6 value back in our equation and check all of these like log x minus 1 terms. Because you can't lock a negative number, things like this x minus 1 always need to be positive. If not, the value will be rejected. Just like me. The second type of question is the let u is equal to something kind. So let's take a look at this question and it almost looks like a quadratic. So we let u is equal to e to the power of x and this equation just becomes very simple to solve from here. So we factorize this using our calculator and we get two values. u is equal to 5 and u is equal to negative 3. So remember we are solving for x so let's bring it back to the x world. Since e to the power of x is always positive, right, we need to reject this negative 3 value. To solve for e to the power of x is equal to 5, we do a lon on both sides to sort of get rid of the e, because remember from our log laws that log e e just becomes 1. And then we get the value of x is equals to ln 5. Do you know about Ditto? No, not the new genes one. I'm talking about the Pokemon. It's straight up one of the coolest Pokemon out there because it can transform into any Pokemon and steal their moves. So you know how our graph is always the y-axis against our x-axis? For this topic, we're gonna pull a pro ditto move and we're gonna transform the x and y-axis into something completely different. Okay, so let's try out this example here. The first part usually wants us to plot like ln m against t. Remember our ditto transformation? Our y-axis is now ln m and our x-axis is now t. So let's make a new ln m row on our table and then we just fill it in, then we can plot the points on our graph paper. Okay, now comes the hard part. The question wants us to use our graph to find the unknown values like m0 and k. So right now the equation of our graph is now ln m equals to like some gradient times t plus some y-intercept. 
So you see the equation here and the question that we haven't used. Our job now is to make this equation look like this. First step, maybe we can start by introducing a lawn on both sides. Now you see this ln m0 times e to the power of negative kt here. We can split them up into two terms by using our log rules from before. So let's bring this negative kt down, and ln e just becomes 1. After shifting it around for a bit, we compare the two equations to find our gradient is negative k, and our y-intercept is ln of m0. Now, last step is then to find the values of the y-intercept and gradient by using the graph. Our y-intercept here is just 4.1 by reading the graph. To solve for m0, we just do ln m0 equals to 4.1. Then we can get m0 is equals to e to the power of 4.1. So next, we can calculate our gradient by taking two random points from the graph, and we can put it into our gradient formula to get negative 0.025. So let's equate that to negative k, and we get the value of k is positive 0.025. Oh, we transform back. Okay, for this topic, anytime you see a 90 degrees angle in a question, you know you gotta use this formula, m1 times m2 is equal to negative 1. So m1, which is the gradient of this line over here, which is 2, times m2, which is the gradient of this line over here, equals to negative 1. So solving for m2, we get m2 is equal to negative 0.5. This formula is literally our main character for this topic, and we're going to use it a lot. Let's show some love to some of our side characters, okay? So the first one is the midpoint theorem. So imagine there's two points and then a line, and you want to find the center point. It's kind of like taking the average. So the new x value is x1 plus x2 divided by 2, and same with the y values. Okay, next is the gradient formula that we all know and love. I mean, if you don't know the gradient formula, um... I think it's time to drop EMath. <laughs> and the last one is actually the distance formula we learned from EMath, which looks like this. There's also this shoelace method, which is used to calculate weird area shapes like this. It's kind of complicated, but basically, right, you put one half outside of this box, and we take any one of the points and put it at the ends of our box. We just go counterclockwise on our diagram and fill in the rest of the values. And the last step is to just add up all these downward diagonals, minus all of these upward diagonals, and we get our answer. Now, let's Avengers assemble all of our characters together to try and solve this question. So the gradient of BC is negative 3 over 2, and since there's a 90 degrees angle here, we can use our main character, m1 times m2 equals to negative 1. So we can solve for the gradient of AB, which is 2 over 3. Now, let's find the equation of the line AB, which is y equals to 2 third x, plus c. So let's sub in this point, negative 2, comma 6, and we can find the value of c, which works out to be 22 over 3. Now that we have the equations of a, b, and b, c, the last step is to put them together to solve for b. And we get the value of x equals to 7, and then we get y equals to 12. This next part here is saying that there's a point d somewhere on the diagram such that this whole thing here will be a rectangle. I know it looks tough, but I'm going to let you in on a top secret method. So there's no formula, you just have to use your eyes and a little bit of common sense, okay? So we find the coordinates of c by first putting y equals to 0 in this equation, and we get c is equals to 15 comma 0. Now, bc is the same direction and length as ad. So if I want to get from b to c, I have to go right by 8 units and down by 12. So using that same logic, if I want to go from A to D, right, I also go right by 8 units, so negative 2 plus 8, and down by 12 units, so 6 minus 12, and the point D is 6, comma, negative 6. You know how in most AMF textbooks, there's the standard form and then the general form for circle equations? Okay, this general form is like complicated, and it's such a pain to memorize, aka it sucks! So, we're gonna take the easy way out, and just not study it! Oh, so what happens if the general form comes out in the exam? Aha, so the trick is to actually convert our general form into standard form by completing the square. In this equation, we group the x terms together, we complete the square, we group the y terms together, and then complete the square again. And then we just shift all the numbers to the other side. Now this is the formula for the standard form that you need to remember. 
So take note that it's x minus a squared and y minus b. Also at the right side, it is r squared, not r. From this equation, the center point of the circle is a comma b, which is negative 1 comma 2 in our example, and the radius r is square root of 25, which is just 5. We know a tangent is just a line that touches the circle at one point, and a normal is perpendicular to the tangent. So it's something like one of those T-pose memes you see on TikTok. This normal line always passes through the center of the circle. In this question, it asks us to find the equation of the tangent. Since the normal passes through the center, negative 1, 2, and the point 2, 6, we can find the gradient which works out to be 4 over 3. Remember our main character, m1 times m2 equals to negative 1? Yeah, we need to use that to find the gradient of the tangent, which is negative 3 over 4. Now the last step is just to find the equation of the line. We sub in the point 2, 6, which is the tangent, and we can find our c value, and we're done. Okay, circles quick fire round! Number 1. A tangent at the top or bottom of the circle is always parallel to the x-axis. Same logic applies for the left and right of the circle. Number 2. In order to show whether a certain point is inside of the circle or outside of the circle, we can calculate the distance from that point to the center using the distance formula. If it's less than the radius, it is in, but if it's more than the radius, then it's outside. Number 3. If a circle is reflected about the y-axis, it's basically mirrored to the other side, kind of like flipping a pancake. If the center is like 2, 2, the center for the reflected circle is negative 2, 2. Do you know how once a drummer figures out a certain pattern for like 4 beats, he can repeat that for like the whole song? Yeah, me neither. But instead of drums, we're trying to figure out the pattern for one cycle of the trigograph, which is called a period. Just like the 28 days version, the one cycle of the trigograph just repeats itself over and over again. Welcome to the Trigonometry Restaurant. On the menu, we have the sine, the cosine, and the tangent dishes that come in two different flavors. The degree flavor and the radian flavor for the more adventurous palate. Okay, okay, I know it's not covered in email, but let me teach you how to convert from degrees to radians, okay? So, just remember that 180 degrees is equal to pi radians. So if I want to convert 45 degrees into radians, right, I just take 45 times pi over 180, which becomes pi over 4. Okay, now let's first cover sine and cosine graphs together because they are very similar. The equation is always a sine bx plus c or a cosine bx plus c. And here's how the general shape of one period looks like for the sine graph and the cosine graph. So let's try out this question. And comparing with the equation, we get a is equal to 3, b is equal to 2, and c is equal to 1. The first step is to calculate the period by taking 360 divided by b, and we get 180 degrees. So what that means is one cycle of this sine graph finishes in 180 degrees. So let's mark it on the diagram over here. We start by drawing out the c is equal to 1 value, which is kind of like the center axis of our graph, where our graph will revolve around. Now let's bring in the a is equal to 3 value, which is how high our sine graph will go up and how low our sine graph will go down from the center line. So 1 plus 3 is equal to 4, and 1 minus 3 is equal to negative 2, and that's our maximum and minimum values. Because a is positive, right, it follows the typical shape by going up first and then it goes down, and it ends at 180 degrees. Since the question wants us to find the range from 0 to 360, we can just copy and paste to finish the drawing. So cosine graphs is almost the same thing, but there's just one small change. So for 3 cosine 2x plus 1, the value of a is positive, so it follows the normal shape where it starts at the top and goes all the way at the bottom and comes all the way back up. For tangent graphs, right, the form is still a tangent bx plus c, but right now the a value doesn't really matter. So this time, the period is 180 divided by b. So because b is equal to 2, the period is 90 degrees. So let's draw our center axis at c is equal to 1. 
And I know it kind of looks like this weird shape where like the first part goes up to heaven and then the second part, I don't know, comes up from hell or something. <laughs> and since the question wants 180 degrees, we can just copy and paste it over. Real, real talk, right? After studying the TYS for many, many years, the drawing of tangent graph is technically still in the syllabus, but has never, never come out before in the past 10 years. But somehow, right, all the schools, they love to set tangent graph in their prelim paper and watch their students suffer. Like, bro, who let them cook? How about let's show my boy tangent graph some love and make A math great again? Okay, 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 wow. If you've watched up to this point, you're probably the most desperate person to pass A math in the world. I originally wanted to make this video cover all the topics in A math, but for my sanity and yours, I decided to split it up into a two-parter. So yeah, the next part will cover the rest of Trigo and then all the Sec 4 topics. In the meantime, why not check out some of my other videos on math, Minecraft, and pigeons. <sighs> okay, I shall go hibernate now in a cave, eat ramen, and watch YouTube. Okay, bye! Wait, but my exam is literally tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're definitely using that clip, right? <laughs>